Welcome, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're joining us for our coverage of the Western Theater. In this case specifically, uh, Middle and West Tennessee and North Mississippi. And I'm super happy to be here at the Stones River National Battlefield. Stones River, often called Murfreesboro as well, is an overlooked battle. End of the year, lots going on in that December. We're gonna hear about it into January. And yet, it is one of the most terrible struggles of the entire Civil War. I mean, people talk about Shiloh and Antietam all the time. They talk about the huge losses at other places. This is not only a costly place, it's a fascinating place. And you know what? It's not destroyed. You can come in here and have a very good experience. Sure, we wish there was a little bit more preserved here at Stones River, but I think through these sets of videos today, you'll see there's a lot to see to have a meaningful battlefield experience. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera for the moment. We have other guests with us as well today, and we really hope you'll share this with your friends. Go to battlefields.org and get inspired, but let's really lay out this campaign here. This campaign taking place in late 1862, indeed, on the last last days or day of 1862. So we're going to switch cameras behind the, uh, over there and hand it over while Chris, you know, he's still tapping it there. Chris White, uh, uh, Deputy Director of Education at the American Battlefield Trust. Thanks, Gary. Uh, we were just rocking out the J-Lo here on the battlefield, if you're wondering. So uh, we, we got a glimpse behind the scene of Gary Edelman. But uh, we're glad to, that you can join us here at Stones River National Battlefield. Um, and if you haven't watched the video yet, uh, head over to our Parker's Crossroads video. Um, that is a, a battle that's taking place simultaneously with the battle that took place here at Stones River or Murfreesboro. Um, and as I did there at Parker's Crossroads, I kind of took us from the 50,000 brought us down to the 500 feet. So what's going on here in um, December of 1862? Well, we actually have to back up to September 1862. Um, the uh, Union war effort at the Battle of Antietam, which took place in Maryland, um, we will see uh, a Union victory there at Antietam. And then in the wake of that victory, we'll have the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation is uh, the preliminary signed on September 22nd, 1862. We're leading up to that midterm election that'll take place in November. Uh, we also have a Confederate offensive that's taking place going up into the heartland of Kentucky in October. And eventually, um, things will go okay for the Union. We'll have a, a, a tactical victory for the Confederates at Perryville, but then that'll turn into a strategic victory for the Union. Then we'll have that victory at Antietam. Uh, and by the end of uh, of October, we're going into that, that election and things don't go well for the Lincoln administration. Um, usually for the sitting for the sitting party or the party in power, things don't always go well during those midterm elections. So now what we're going to start to see is a shakeup in the Union High Command. As we discussed earlier in some of our videos, Lincoln in February of 1862 had, had told his, his men, go forward, bring me victories before February 22nd, uh, George Washington's birthday. Things seem to go okay at Fort Henry and Donaldson, where we've already been to Shiloh and other places like New Orleans and Island Number 10. Well, now we fast forward to the end of the year, and Lincoln again is pushing his generals to go forward. January 1st of 1863, he's going to sign that Emancipation Proclamation officially, so he is going to start sending field armies into the South. Uh, probably the most famous action that takes place will be between Robert E. Lee and Ambrose Burnside, the shortest tenured commander of the Army of the Potomac, 77 days, and that'll be the Battle of Fredericksburg, which is a Union debacle. Uh, then, uh, if you fast forward, go out December 24th, 1862, we'll have the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, where things don't go very well for William T. Sherman in Grant's drive towards Vicksburg. Then we'll also see some Confederate maneuvers. We'll see the Holly Springs Raid led by Earl Van Dorn, the Lothario Earl Van Dorn. Then we'll see John Morgan uh, make a raid. We'll also have Nathan Bedford Forrest at that battle at Parker's Crossroads, crossing the Tennessee River into West Tennessee and making uh, advances, trying to slow down that Union advance towards Vicksburg. But while all this is happening, we have two newly named armies here that will clash about 32 miles southeast of Nashville and about 30 miles due east of Franklin at the town of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And this will be the Battle of Stones River or the Battle of Murfreesboro, depending on what side you're on. Stones River for the north, Murfreesboro for the south. This will put uh, William Rosecrans uh, in charge of the newly dubbed Army of the Cumberland and we'll have Braxton Bragg in charge of the Army of Tennessee. These will be two of the principal armies out here in the Western Theater, and the two will clash here in December and January 1862. And this will be, to kind of give away the, the, the game, the only victory that Abraham Lincoln's gonna be able to claim here in this late 
winter or this late uh, year of 1862 and 1863 when he signs that Emancipation Proclamation. And William Rosecrans will bring home a very bloody but a very vital victory here at, at Stones River. So to talk about the battle here, I'm going to bring on Chief Ranger Jim Lewis. Uh, Jim's been here a long time, 25 years, and he is the expert on Stones on Stones River. So Jim, um, where are we standing? Uh, on the battlefield, and uh, how do we get the two armies right here to clash with one another? Where, where we're standing right now is about as far south as a person can walk within Stones River National Battlefield. Um, just behind me here, you can probably see some cars going back and forth. That's the Wilkinson Pike, uh, which, although it's a wider paved road today, is actually one of the historic roads that runs through or around the battlefield. The armies, once they finally arrived here, Rosecrans will actually begin his campaign on the day after Christmas, 1862, uh, take the Union Army about four days slogging through the mud, muck, sleet, and rain to finally arrive here at Murfreesboro. Um, we're about halfway in the, we're about in the center of you know the, the Union Army uh, at the uh, opening of the Battle of Stones River. It extends about a mile and a half to our north to the Stones River, and behind me across the Wilkinson Pike, about a mile and a half to our south with the Confederate Army anywhere from a half to a quarter mile east in lines running roughly parallel um, uh, just outside the, the town of Murfreesboro. So two armies settle in for the evening on December 30th and Generals Rosecrans and Bragg begin to plan their attacks, which as luck would have it, they both come up with essentially the same plan, which is to attack the enemy on his right flank, get in around behind him and cut off his supply line and retreat route. Um, while they're doing that, um, the soldiers begin to try to bed down as best they can. Everybody's been called out of their camps um, on the Confederate side. The Union Army is traveling, you know, without tents and things like that, so they just lay down in the mud. Um, that evening, according to several accounts, uh, up and down the line, um, as things got dark, uh, some of the bands began playing music to uh, kind of lift the men's spirits. Um, and what ensued was sort of what was referred to as a battle of the bands. Uh, you'd have, you know, Dixie and Bonnie Blue Flag coming from, uh, you know, the Confederate side and the Union side, Yankee Doodle, Battle Cry of Freedom. Everybody's trying to outplay, out loud everybody else, and even they're competing with each other on the same side. So it was a cacophony. And then somewhere along the line, and nobody knows who, but one of the bands started playing a relatively new song called Home Sweet Home. And bit by bit, one by one, all the bands began picking up that song until it was like you could hear it in unison throughout the entire battlefield. And it was said even in some places the men lifted their voices up in song. And then when those final chords died out in one of the most poignant events on any battlefield during the Civil War, I imagine you could have heard a pin drop because now you have 81,000 soldiers contemplating the fact that they may never see home sweet home again because they are now facing one another. The battle begins about a mile and a half to our south. The Confederates have the, the plan that will place them in the driver's seat to begin with. Uh, Rosecrans's plan for attack involves crossing the Stones River and then working his way along the east bank into Murfreesboro, which is going to take several hours to happen. But Bragg has basically lined up his men so that his left flank extends out beyond the Union right flank far enough so that his orders are simple. When the sun comes up, attack. They will hit, they'll start to try to wheel around, they'll kind of roll that line up, and then Basically, every unit to the north uh, will be looking to their left, waiting for the men on their left to move forward, and then they will move forward. It's an initial on attack. It's Bragg's favorite plan. He uses it in almost every battlefield. Um, and when the Confederates do hit and make their initial attack against the far right end of the Union right wing, they're not ready. Uh, they're being very accommodating. This seems to you guys were at Shiloh already once, so I mean, we. We've been through this before, haven't we? Um, Union soldiers are still just getting up at daybreak, making little fires, trying to boil up their coffee, uh, and the Confederates come streaming in. McCown's division, followed by Claiborne's, is a battering ram that hits the right flank of the, of the Union line. Well, 
it's pretty easy to tell what happens after that. They get driven off pretty quickly. In fact, one Confederate soldier from Mector's Texas Brigade said that as they were moving through those Union positions, he literally saw dead Yankees lying on the ground clutching their coffee cups uh, because they didn't even have time to drop them. They had knocked them down so fast. A little farther up the line, some Union, a Union soldier talked about running to the stacks of arms, pulling them out, ramming down the round, getting ready to fire in, only to realize they had nothing to shoot at because they were already 300 yards behind enemy lines. They had already been completely overrun. And so it looks like the Confederates at the outset are going to win this battle. And bit by, by bit, they will begin to wrap and break drive the Union, the Union right wing back and begin breaking it. First it's Johnson's division, then it's Davis's division. Finally, they reach Philip Sheridan's division, whose left flank actually lies on the Wilkinson Pike out here. Sheridan had his men up and ready to fight at four o'clock in the morning. And so when the initial Confederate attacks hit him from the front, he was able to knock them back. But because of what's happening beyond him to the right, the Confederates are streaming in and around behind his rear. What that forces Sheridan to do is actually order his, his brigade commanders, once they, they, they win their fights in front of them and see the enemy start to pull back, he orders them to counterattack, to drive the enemy back farther so that it'll buy him some breathing space. And then bit by bit, piece by piece, he'll begin refusing the right end of his line, turning it from running basically north to south until finally his lines will be in these fields and along these tree lines where we're standing right now at about 10 o'clock on December 31st, 1862, facing directly to the south. He's pivoted his entire division to place it in a V-shaped formation with Negley's division over here to the east through these tree lines over here. And that's what brings us really to the crux of the fight that we term now as the slaughter pen. That was great, Jim, and that's a, a, a lot. And let's unpack that just a little bit before we're done. Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, we are doing one of our Western swings. We're on the Stones River National Battlefield, and we hope you'll share this with your friends. Now, Jim said a lot over there. So the Union, you know, is expecting to attack on the Confederate right again. You know, this is, uh, you know, a, a, just as the Confederates are contemplating the same thing. This is hardly unique. This happens at the Battle of Bull Run, and whoever attacks first sort of gets to control that stuff just a little bit better. Happens on Culp's Hill at Gettysburg, where both sides are planning a similar thing. And whoever attacks first usually works. The Confederates are going to do it here. Now, these folks, these people that the Confederates are attacking, Claiborne and McCown, are really going to fall upon uh, McCook's Corps, or McCook's Command, so to speak. And you've got McCook, you've got Thomas, you've got Crittenden. And Rosecrans, it's my understanding, is sort of over closer to Crittenden, pretty far away from here. And, you know, he remember, you know, I remember something, I'll butcher it, and this might be the first of many times Jim Lewis corrects me today. Um, but, you know, don't lose it. Rosecrans sort of knows McCook. He knows him to be smart, knows him to be courageous, knows him to be loyal. But he later says, if only his judgment was as high as my opinion as those other attributes, maybe he could have held for the three hours that he said he could. The way Jim describes it, this was not three hours, this was not two hours, this was not one hour. They broke pretty quick, so would have anybody given that positioning. But it really shows how somebody like Sheridan, who fed his men that morning, who's ready to stand and fight and come up with a plan and execute that plan, can really have a huge impact upon the battle, Jim. Did I mess anything up there? No, you didn't. I mean, Rose Francis is new to command. He knows McCook and Thomas and Crittenden as people. He's gotten to know them some there, but they haven't fought together. And so he really has no clue who can do what. I mean, I'm not sure he heard that uh, McCook's nickname amongst the soldiers was Chucklehead. Um, maybe that would have helped. Um, I don't know. But, I mean, and he also, you know, there's other things going on here. I mean, you know, the rightmost division of the Army, which up and just before, you know, we get to this campaign, is actually being commanded by Joshua Sill, who has fallen back to be one of Sheridan's uh, brigade commanders, has now been handed over to Richard Johnson, who had failed miserably as a cavalry commander. So we're going to try him now as a commander of a division of infantry. And that works out really well here at Stones River. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, but there is a malaise that goes on in the right wing of the Union Army that, uh, you know, is, is kind of strange. I mean, Rosecrans tells McCook he needs four hours for this to work. And he kind of relies on McCook to take care of that. Um, maybe because he's new to command, he should have actually taken, you know, taken some steps to actually see what was going on there. McCook basically goes to sleep. <laughs> uh, he issues no positive orders to any of his division commanders. And Richard Johnson, who is, again, new to this, this, this racket, 
he does nothing either. So the Union right flank is swinging in the wind. Um, and it's, it's it, you, know, on, you know, the other two division commanders, Davis and Sheridan, who are experienced, do have their men ready to go that morning. But Johnson's men aren't. And once that barn door is open, even with all the preparation made by Sheridan and, and, and Davis, ultimately by the late morning, you've had the entire right side of the Union line either completely obliterated and what's left of it is now clinging for life here along the Wilkinson Pike. Good, good. And I'll just cruise by to say this is Chris Mikowski, Emerging Civil War. Now, I am not a big fan of Phil Sheridan, and we're standing here next to a sign that says, Sheridan saves the day. And I will have to give props to the bandy-legged Irishman, or Shelby Foot like to call him, because he is the linchpin that holds this line and saves this army. Um, I'm not a big fan of Sheridan because of stuff that he that happens later in the war as he gets out to the east. Uh, he tends to do a lot of showboating, tends to be a lot of bluster, tends to use his division commanders really effectively, and I think they're the ones that really buoy him to success. But Jim, let me bring you back on because you had this great line a second ago, and I don't want to steal it. I said, um, you know, and Chris White made this point that that Sheridan uses his division commanders well out east. How does he use them here at Stones River? He uses them well and he uses them up <laughs> because ultimately when this fight is over, um, by the time the fighting here in the slaughter pen is over, two of his three brigade commanders, Joshua Sill um, um, being one of them, will be dead or mortally wounded on the field. And before the day is done, his third commander, Frederick Schaefer, will also uh, perish in the fight. So, I mean, the, you know, Sheridan's division finds itself in a really tough spot. And just to make you happy, Chris, I always say, you know, we, we changed this. When I first got here, the, the thing said Sheridan's stand. And I'm like, well, uh, he's moving backwards. You know who's standing? James Negley. James Negley is the wall upon which Sheridan is pivoting. This doesn't work if... If not, you know, if Sheridan's not doing what he's doing and keeping his right flank away from the enemy, but it also doesn't work if Negley doesn't hold his ground long enough for Sheridan to be able to do that. This is a two, two pronged monster that we got here, and I do like to give James Negley his props. Thank you, Pennsylvania. You can all. Yeah. All right. Chris knows one of his descendants. Chris White, that is, and that's a perfect transition. Uh, you know, we've already set up the next fight, and the next fight is taking place in the strangest place at Stones River National Battlefield. So join us um, for our next video over at the Slaughter Pen and talk about whether the Confederates are just as disorganized in victory as the Union has been in retreat. Chris White behind the camera, Chris Mikowski, uh, Jim Lewis, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching and supporting Battlefield Preservation and education.